Mantor Ministries presents the Mantor Guy Podcast. We may talk about football. We could mention bacon. We might reference Rocky movies. We'll probably discuss the Mantor conferences, but we'll definitely talk about how to grow in our walk with God. Here's your host, the Mantor Guy, Jamie Holden. Hey guys, welcome back to the Mantor Guy Podcast. Jamie Holden here, and I'm so happy to have you back with us once again this week. Well, guys, this week we're happy to bring you the main session message from our recent Central PA mentor. Pastor Phil Mendito, who's a pastor of Philadelphia Christian Center in Ben Salem, PA, brought a powerful challenge to the men to learn from the man in the Bible who refused to rise and shine. He examined the life of a man who refused to rise, to stand up and do what God called him to do. And we had such a tremendous response and feedback from the men that we want to give you a chance to hear this message. So check out this word from Pastor Phil at our 2021 Central PA Mentor. Amen. I don't know where I would be without the Lord. Amen. And uh, left up to ourselves, we make a mess of a lot of things, don't we? And uh, I walked in this sanctuary today and I saw something I never saw before. And uh, a bed on the platform. And uh, I, I, I checked, wanted to check my schedule a little bit. Is he expecting me to preach laying in that bed? I said, I'm 65 years old. I'm not quite going to, I can't get enough breath laying down. Amen. But uh, I appreciate the theme of this uh, um, conference, Rise and Shine. And it is the theme and a godly man's call to rise and shine. Um, I believe every one of you that are here today are here because you love God. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. And uh, you have a lot of things you can do on Saturday. Am I right? And, uh, but you're here today because there is a desire in your heart to rise and shine and be more of what God wants us to be. And uh, I want to encourage you, uh, the book that uh, Jamie has written, uh, called Burning Daylight and, uh, has to do with rising and shine. The theme of this conference is taken from that book and, uh, what a great book. I want to encourage you to get that book and get, read it. I don't know whether they have them for sale today. But uh, you ought to read that book. It's a real challenge. Amen. And uh, the fact is that God calls us to rise and shine, correct? And I thought about that for a moment. And I, and I thought, where in the Bible, um, is there anything in the Bible that God directly tells us to rise and shine? And uh, I mean, those words exactly. And uh, so I found them. Only one place in the whole Bible. It's found in the book of Acts, chapter 26 and verse 16. And uh, it's very interesting. How many of you ever heard of Saul of Tarsus, right? Yeah, you know, eventually became the Apostle Paul. If you want to know about his conversion, you read Acts 9. What a fabulous conversion. I mean, he was a demon-possessed devil, and God delivered him. Amen. On the spot, blinded him for a few days so he couldn't go back to his old ways. And, uh, and eventually became uh, the great apostle of the church and wrote 14 of the books of the New Testament, if you count Hebrews. And so he's a great man of God. But it's very interesting. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 16, Saul, I mean Paul at that time, is, um, is uh, relating his uh, experience with God on the road to Damascus. And he says some things in Acts 26 and verse 16 that we didn't see in the Acts 9 passage. And he uses, God specifically said to him, rise and shine. It's the only word in scripture where you actually see God directly telling someone to rise and shine. Let me read it for you. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 16, God said to him, he's relating this as what God said to him. He said, this is what God said to me, but rise and shine on your feet. Rise and shine on your feet. For I have appeared to you this for this purpose. To make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. Now, when I went to that passage of scripture, it was interesting to me. God literally said, rise and shine on your feet. He didn't say rise and shine while sitting down. He said, rise and shine on your feet. And that meant action. Take this serious and move your life in a direction where you can rise and shine for me, Paul. And then God told him, he said, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. How many know God has a purpose for your life today? Amen. Every one of you, you're not some blob floating around there. God has a purpose for your life. And uh, I remember when I was a teenager, uh, I was kind of a shy kid and, and uh, probably the last kid you ever expect to be in the ministry. And I often wonder, what am I going to do? Maybe I'll work on cars. Maybe I'll be a trash man. I don't know. But uh, you never know uh, what purpose God has for you. Amen. 
And, but God says, I have a purpose for you uh, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. Now, we're living in a very interesting day, especially in America, aren't we? And uh, this is almost, we're being called the mass culture. Amen. But uh, I want to challenge you today, man. Look, I said it before. I'll say it again. You're here because you want to be here. No one tied you and made you come. You're here because you love God. It's as simple as that. And, uh, but I believe God is calling us as men, all of us. Uh, God's calling us sometimes, many times, to take the mask down of our lives. Now, we may physically have to wear a mask in our society now some places. It's easing up. But I wonder how many masks we have up when it comes to our spiritual lives and our relationship with God. Uh, some them, someone said to me the other day, isn't it a shame that this COVID thing came? And I know, I know every church, I, I know every church has, has experienced a let up during the COVID time. And that's understandable. And uh, many of our churches yet have not fully uh, re- come back. Uh, from the COVID. But um, I, I, I said to someone the other day, I wonder if, if God allowed this thing because it's doing something for us that's good. And the only thing I can think of is I believe in some respects that may be true. I believe God is using this thing to expose some things in our lives that we wouldn't see otherwise. And uh, the power of fear uh, we're seeing for the first time this thing called spirit of fear, the power of fear to grip us, to grip the whole church and, and uh, where there's a fear. Uh, and and uh, sometimes it exposes our weaknesses. And uh, we go through a time where we see ourselves as being lukewarm. How many of you ever been lukewarm in your life? You may be now, but I hope after this weekend it'll be get taken care of. Amen? And what it does, we've seen the church settle down into complacency. I know Jamie in his book talks about this. Um, you know, uh, one thing we fight every day, guys, and let me just tell you something. It's not just you men that sit in the pews. We preachers struggle with the same thing you do. You see, we're not always that honest to say it, but we do. Every, every temptation you face, we face. We're men. Just because we have a title in our name doesn't mean that we have risen above the experiences of life. And uh, every one of us struggle with complacency. There's many times in our life where we just move out of the norm and we get a little lazy spiritually. Isn't that true? And we become complacent. And I think the men in our churches uh, often, and, and it's happened to us, we become complacency. And how does that happen? That happens when we allow the cares of life to mean more to us and take more of our energy than our time with God. Now, we don't plan that. You don't wake up in the morning and say, today, God, I'm going to get lukewarm. We just don't do that. We don't wake up in the morning and say, today, God, I'm going to fall into a temptation and I'm going to be a sinner. We don't do that. We don't want to do that. We don't desire to do that. But it gradually comes into our life. Complacency is not something that hits us overnight. It's a gradual thing. Let me illustrate it this way. If you've ever ever read the book of Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, God commands the Ephesians for having a great faith and love. Isn't that true? You read it, you'll find it. Now, the book of Ephesians is written about 60 AD. 30 years later, when John the Revelator is writing the book of Revelation, around 90 AD, give or take a few years, he writes in Revelation chapter 2, he writes to the same church, the church of Ephesus, the first of the seven churches of Asia Minor. What's he say today? God says you've lost your first love. But now, wait a minute. This is the same church that Paul commended them for such a great love. And 30 years later, God is saying, you lost your first love. And the following words, the way he speaks to them, are not kind. See? Now, to me, that illustrates to us that we don't become complacent overnight. We become complacent over a period of time. It takes time for us to get complacent with the things of God. It takes time. It doesn't run on a fast track. It runs on a very slow track. Because the devil is wise. The devil knows if he comes in like a brainstorm, you're going to know what, he, you're going to know what he's up to. You're going to see it. So he works a little bit at a time. He injects a little differences into your life each day. And uh, he fills your time a little more with things that have nothing to do with God. He gets you worrying about the things of life rather than rejoicing in the things of God. Isn't that true? Come on. It happens to all of us. It happens to pastors. If we don't watch ourselves, we can become complacent. So um, I, I believe that we need to, we need the help of the God uh, to break out of this complacency. Now, this is what I want to do today, and I won't be long. I want to talk about the man who failed to rise and shine. Now, we can go in the Bible and look at several guys that failed to rise and shine. 
We can look at many acquaintances in the church that we know of that they have failed to rise and shine. Um, through the years, I have watched people who were once on fire for God and totally fall into a backslidden condition and into horrific sin. And uh, I've seen families destroyed, and, 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 and it breaks my heart. But there's one person in the Bible uh, that failed to rise and shine. He had everything going for him. He had so much going for him. The anointing of God was on his life. But he failed to rise and shine. He failed to see the complacency slowly coming into his life. And uh, the name of that man was Samson. How many of you ever heard of Samson? All right. Now, most of the time we hear about Samson, we hear it in a children's story. First time I heard about Samson, I was a young boy growing up in Sunday school in the Assembly of God Church. And, and back then uh, in the Assembly of God Church in Sunday school, uh, most of the curriculum was out of the Old Testament. And uh, you learned about the great faith stories of the Old Testament. You knew about Noah, you knew about Jonah, you knew about uh, Daniel and the lion's den. And, and uh, uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were talk Carol and I were talking to someone, and they've been saved for about 25 years. And, and, I, and I mentioned something about the three Hebrew children. And the person said to me, what's the three Hebrew children? They never heard of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it floored me sometimes how little of the word uh, we've allowed to get into our lives. But Samson was a man who failed to rise and shine. Samson was a man who not only failed to rise and shine, but I, I want us today, I want us to look at the actions and the decisions of Samson that caused him not to rise and shine. Now, I can spend all day telling you how to rise and shine, the things to bring into your life. And we'll touch briefly on that. But I think it's good today that we take a close look at the things that could hinder us from rising and shining, the things that hold us back. And uh, now, Samson was a judge of Israel for over 20 years. You know the story. God blessed him with enormous strength. And one day, uh, he killed a thousand of the Philistines. And, and uh, he was just a powerful man. And there was a secret about it. And, uh, but, uh, Samson was so powerful and, uh, that the Philistines hated him. The Philistines hated the Israelites and he was a judge in Israel. So, uh, they, he, he just, he, he just bothered them and uh, be, not only destroying their, uh, uh, their soldiers, but it just wasn't a good relationship. And, uh, Judges 16, in Judges chapter 16, Samson gives us the key himself in his own words to his success. He says, no razor has ever been used on my head because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. Now, this is fine to say in the privacy of your home. This is fine to be laying down at night in your bed and, and give away the secret of the strength that God's given you. But he didn't say it in a safe environment. They are the words he said to Delilah. Now, Delilah was a vicious woman. She was a bad woman, amen? And Samson says to her, no razor ever been used on my head. So Samson fell in love with a vicious woman. He fell in love with a bad woman. And uh, the devil brought this woman into his life, and in his complacency, he failed to see the warning signs. And uh, so the Philistines came along, and what they did do? They went to Delilah and said, look, we'll pay you money. We'll pay you a lot of silver if you just can tell us the source of his strength. We want to drain him from his strength so we can beat him. Amen. So there were things that uh, Samson did that uh, caused him not to rise and shine. I want to go through this real quick. Write them down if you have paper, all right? Uh, it's very important. First of all, Sam Samson gave ear to the wrong kind of pleasure. Samson gave ear to the wrong kind of pleasure. Sometimes in our life, um, we're not rising and shining because we have spent too much time giving our ear. We've been listening too much to the wrong kind of pleasure. I didn't say the wrong kind of person. I said the wrong kind of pleasure. And uh, the, way, uh, the way to defeat Satan easily, guys, is to just stop listening to him. Now, I know there's been a thousand books written on how to beat up the devil, how to defeat the enemy. But look, I'm, I'm not an author. I'm not smart enough to write a book. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't preach a lot of places, very seldom. So I'm, I'm used to just preaching to our own people. But I, I will share with you something that I believe with all my, all my heart. You can read all the books and they're great. Keep reading them. They're written by anointed men of God. But the quick way, the quick way to not let Satan cause you to, not to rise and shine 
The quick way not to be defeated by the Satan is just stop listening to him. Just stop listening to the devil. Simple. Just stop listening. You say, Pastor, how do you do that? Well, this is why you got to be in the Word of God. Because you got to learn what God is saying to you from his Word. What is the will of God? Then when the devil speaks to you, the Holy Spirit will let you know that he's telling you something different than God's telling you. And whenever you hear something different than what the Word of God tells you, you know what? You know what? It's something you should not follow. So just simply stop listening to him. Now, I said to you, Samson gave ear to the wrong kind of pleasure. Do you know Delilah was pleasure for him? Though he found pleasure in Delilah. I'm going to show that to you in a moment. He found a lot of pleasure in Delilah. He gave his ear to the wrong kind of pleasure. You say, what do you mean, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, there were four times. There were at least four times that we know of that Delilah went to him and, and questioned him about the, the reason for his strength. Now, this is where Samson started to have fun with this. He found pleasure in Delilah. He was having fun with this whole scenario. Let me, let me give you an illustration. She went to him one time, and this was, this was the first answer. He said, bind me with seven thresh thongs. Just bind me. Now, that wasn't the truth, but he was having fun with her. He was playing with pleasure. Then she came to him again, and he said, well, you can tie me with new, roop, new ropes. Make sure they're new ropes. He's taunting her again. He's playing with this danger. See, he would have been better off never to get an answer at all. In fact, he would have been better off not even getting involved with the devil. Correct? See, but he already messed up here. He's already uh, throwing his life away. He's not rising and shining because he's given ear to some wrong kind of pleasure. So she comes to him the third time. Now, the third time is dangerous because in the third time he says to her, weave my hair. Now, this is the first time he mentions hair. He's getting closer to the truth. This is really a danger point. The third time is dangerous because he brings the hair as an issue. He's getting close. Now she knows that, you know what? The hair must have something to do with it. See? So then she comes a fourth time. And what's he say to her a fourth time? And, and I read it to you earlier. His, this, this is what he said there in Judges 16. We read it earlier. He says, no razor has ever been used on my head because I've been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. He just blurted it out. Now, why was he so honest with her? Because he played with this pleasure. He taunted this pleasure. It didn't happen overnight. It took three other times for her to come. And, and I don't know if there's something in your life that's holding you down and it's causing you not to rise and shine. That didn't happen overnight. I guarantee you that you played with it. You played with it. And there were times, there were, uh, there were opportunities you had to get away from it. But you slowly get sucked into it. The devil loves to do it. Are you hearing me? All right. So now Satan is still using the razor today. He hasn't put the razor away. He's still using the razor. He's using the razor He's using this level of deception and foolishness to keep us from rising and shining. Now, I'm going to be honest with you guys. We have everything to gain to rise and shine for the Lord. Amen? Don't believe the lies that the devil likes to feed you out there. Well, to rise and shine, it's going to cost me something. To rise and shine, I'm going to have to ignore my kids. To rise and shine, I'm going to give all my time to the church. To rise and shine, I'm going to have to pray a lot. And, you know, some people feel to rise and shine, you have to have a Azusa Street experience every day. God's not expecting an Azusa Street experience from you every day. God just wants you reading, your, reading his word and praying every day. There's, there, this is, don't make this bigger than what it is, amen? If we will simply just give attention to God every day, and when we read his word, take serious every bit of it, we will rise and shine. Anytime you make the word of God or prayer priority in your life, you will rise and shine. There's no way you can be into the word every day and pray every day and not rise and shine. I believe that. I may, someone may disagree, but that's what I believe. I believe there's so much power that comes from our time in prayer and our time in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit causes us to rise and shine. See? So it's not more difficult than what you think. Amen? And uh, one of the problems is people still listen to the wrong kind of information. If we can uh, close what we're listening to, if we can cut off the pleasure that we're listening to that's not healthy for us, now, don't get me wrong. We all need some pleasure in our life, correct? 
I don't know. How many of you have hobbies in here? There, I can see you a little more. How many of you have hobbies? About 10 of you have hobbies. Where are the rest of you guys? Wow. I was talking to a guy in, in, in our church the other day. He said, Pastor, you know what my hobby is? I said, no, what's your hobby? And he's a police officer. I said, what's my hobby? And then he showed me a video of his hobby. I said, you are crazy. He races motorcycles. And, and, and there's a picture of him with the motorcycle leaning so far down to the side that it actually looks like his leg is scraping on the ground. But, of course, it wasn't. And uh, someone else said, well, my hobby is, sky, is skydiving. Good. I'm glad it's yours and not mine. But everybody needs some pleasure, correct? Everybody needs, I, I like fishing, and I only live about an hour and 10 minutes from the ocean, so I can do ocean fishing, I can do freshwater fishing. Um, I never catch much, but um, I'm the only one that goes out fishing with the guys at the church every year on their fishing trip. They all catch something and I don't. And then they feel sorry, but that's kind of smart. That's God doing that, because by the end of the day, they feel bad for the pastor, and they give me some of their fish, and I don't have to catch it. And it's already clean and ready to go, amen. Say, God, keep it coming, amen. So Samson gave ear to the wrong kind of pleasure. Here's another thing that Samson did that caused him not to rise and shine. Samson associated with the wrong crowd. Guys, let me tell you something. There's a good crowd and there's a wrong crowd. There is a good crowd. This is a good crowd here today. You're probably not going to go wrong if, you're, if, if you make more time to be around the guys in the church. This is the good crowd. That One of the best things you can do this Saturday morning is what you're doing today. Coming together, coming together and challenging each other. And uh, it's great. But Samson associated with the wrong crowd. And, uh, and here's the problem with this. Listen very close to what I'm about to say. A person through association gets used to anything. I believe with all my heart that a person associated, a person through association gets used to anything. It won't take you long. Whoever you associate with, if they're not good, if they're not a good person to associate with, sooner or later you get used to them. Sooner or later they break down your resistance. It always happens that way. And before you know it, before you know it, you don't see, you don't see the influence that's not helping you. And uh, can you, how many of you remember, uh, they say it happened in about 1963 or 64, I'm not sure, but do you remember the first time profanity was used on TV? The first time profanity was used on TV, oh, there was an outrage. Churches were going to boycott television. It, it was just an outrage. And now, how many have turned on your television set lately? Amen? And come on, how many times profanity comes across and we sit there? It has no more effect on us. It has no more effect. You see, when we associate with something or somebody long enough, there's a way that we adjust to that. We lose we lose seeing the difference. And uh, we become more and more like them through our association. Uh, back in 1994, back in 1994, we had a, a guy get saved at Philadelphia Christian Center, and, and him and his wife got saved. And she was a little spitfire at first, but um, they got saved. And, and, you know, they were these new converts. The pastors know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you have some new converts that they don't know it's 2 o'clock in the morning. They're reading the Bible two o'clock in the morning. Let's call the pastor, see what he thinks. And, you know, and, and, and these people are notorious. Two o'clock in the morning, and, you know, and you're on. One day, one day, Mike said to me, Pastor, I just was reading the Bible. I said, Mike, can't you wait till eight in the morning to read it? He was reading the Bible, the Bible and he says, Pastor, where did Aaron's sons get their wives? Never thought about that, did you? And I said, Mike, I don't care where they got their wives. They had wives. <laughs> well, later I gave him the biblical answer. God allowed them to marry their sisters. But not 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, Mike got saved and Mike became a powerhouse for God. He became a powerhouse for God. And uh, so much so that he, he started the witnessing teams in the church. And he became our evangelism director. And, and uh and, uh, you know, and he went out. He was powerful on the streets. What a gifted evangelist. Anyone he talked to, he's went into the Lord. And then Mike started to get interested in bodybuilding. And uh, so I, I, I saw gradually. And now Mike today, if you would see Mike today, he, he's, he's like Superman. He's got, he's got uh, his arms are bigger than my stomach. Well, not quite, but anyway, it seems like at times. 
And Mike started to go to the gym and work out. Nothing wrong with going to the gym. Nothing wrong with working out. I probably should do it. Amen. But um, uh, he was going to the gym and working out. But I noticed, okay, it was an hour, maybe once a week. And that it, before you knew it, it was almost four hours every night of the week, except for Sunday. And, uh, and then he started to get drawn in by a woman that was there. Sooner or later, he had an affair with the woman and destroyed his marriage. And his marriage has been destroyed ever since. Now, from time to time, I see Mike. And you know what Mike says to me? He says, Pastor, I still love God. I'm, I'm trying. I still love God. Pastor, keep praying for me. I know what the truth is. And I would say, so Mike, you do know what the truth is. And I'm going to pray God get your heart right. Amen. But how, why did that happen? Because he got too used to associating with the wrong crowd. Friends, guys, listen to me. It can happen to any of us. None of us are exempt from it. None of us. If I hang around a miserable person long enough, I'm going to be miserable like them. Okay? And, and it happens to all of us. And, and if we want to rise and shine, we got to watch the pleasure we're listening to. We got to watch our association with the wrong crowd. Another thing we got to watch, Samson failed. Now, this is important. Are you ready for this one? All right. Samson failed to love what God loves and hate what God hates. That's powerful. Samson failed to love what God loves and hate what God loves. You, have, you, have, you need to ask yourself a question. Do I hate what God hates and do I love what God loves? That's a good question. I've asked myself that question. God, do I really hate what you hate? Do I really love what you love? And uh, I'm very concerned about the church in America. And I think most pastors are. Um, I think most pastors would admit the church in America is not what God intended it to be. Um, maybe I go a step further and maybe I'm wrong. I leave myself up to be rebuked. I'm not a know-it-all, but I just feel in my heart that, that a lot of problems in America has just maybe, just maybe it's because the church has become complacent. You see, sometimes we've allowed the culture to, 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 to uh, influence the church when we should have been influencing the culture. And uh, it, it, it kind of, I want to read something to you. I saw the other day on, uh, on, on, on computer, and I just wrote it down. It's not mine. It's not original with me. I don't even know who wrote it, but it sounds good. Amen. But this is so true. Listen to the flow. He said, first we overlook evil, then we permit evil. Then we legalize evil, then we promote evil. Then we celebrate evil, then we persecute those who still call it evil. It's true, isn't it? But it's not only true, but it shows the gradual flow. Not only in America, not only in the church, but in our own personal lives. We fail to rise and shine when we start hating what God hates. It, it's, it, it, I say it like this. If we turn a piece of candy over and over again in our mouth, it sure shows we like it. Amen? The longer we keep a piece of candy in our mouth, it shows we like it. But when we hear things that are going to hurt us spiritually, we need to spit it out. We need not turn it around in our mouth over and over again. You see, every man is tempted, right? And, and you've heard and you know temptation is not a sin. Jesus was tempted, okay, although he knew no sin. But temptation is not a sin. It becomes sin when we turn it over in our mouth. We taste it and we like to taste and more and more and more. We don't spit it out. We just churn it in our mouth. And before you know it, we find ourselves really not hating the things God hates and really not loving the things God loves. And that's what happened with Samson. He failed to rise and shine because he just never got to the place where he hated what God hates and loved what God loves. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says something very powerful. Uh, and it, it, it's in, in, in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians. It says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Listen, guys, you've read this verse many times. Bringing every thought, not thoughts, not phrases, not paragraphs. Paul made this very personal, very singular. He said, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What he's teaching us is, if we want to rise and shine for the Lord, it has to begin up here. It has to begin up here. And uh, we got to begin realizing and, uh, that there are thoughts that come into our mind that we can't wait for the paragraph. we got to change the thought. 
It's the one thought that can bring us down. Not because the one thought in itself has power, but the one thought, we toss it around in our mouth like a piece of candy. And the more, listen, the more you entertain a thought that's wrong, the better it tastes, the longer you keep it. And that's why Paul says, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Uh, Brother Jamie Holden uh, said something in his book, and I, and I pick up a little bit on, his, on his, uh, what he said. He, he made a quote. He said, God's way is so counterculture. And I got thinking about that. God's way is so counterculture. It's in the book, Daylight Burning. God, uh, God's way is so counterculture. Guys, we'll be back with the remainder of this message right after the break. I know you're going to dig this. Like what you're hearing? Head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Thanks. Men of God, it is time to rise and shine. Join us for the 2021 Mantor Spring Conferences, where we'll be discussing this year how men of God need to stop dimming their light, they need to stop burning daylight, and it's time to rise and shine. God has called us to be light to a dark world. It's our call, it's our mandate, and it's our mission. Visit MantorMinistries.com for all the dates, locations, and speakers at for this year's Rise and Shine Mantor Conferences. Men, you do not want to miss it. Make sure that you are at your local Mantor Conference in 2021. No more burning daylight, guys. It's time to rise and shine. For Mantor conference dates and locations, visit MantorMinistries.com. Don't forget to visit iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Thanks. Guys, we have something brand new for you as we head into 2021. For the first time ever, Mantor Ministries has put together a one-year Bible reading plan called Burning Daylight. This 365-day Bible reading plan will consist of six days of Bible reading specifically planned for men and one day of a devotional each week for all 52 weeks of the year. It is completely free. You can sign up for this daily Bible reading plan at mantorministries.com slash Bible plan today. It's time we know what we believe as men of God and we develop our convictions and these convictions are developed through God's word. And to develop these commissions, you got to know what the Bible says. So sign up today for our free one-year Bible reading plan, Burning Daylight, at MantorMinistries.com Bible Plan. That's MantorMinistries.com slash Bible Plan. The Mantor Guy Podcast, helping men grow in their walk with God. Hey guys, Jimmy Holden here, the Mantor Guy. And you know, so often men tell me that they can't afford to use covenant eyes. And my immediate response back is, dude, you can't afford not to use covenant eyes. For 53 cents a day, you can protect every computer, every laptop, every tablet and cell phone that you and your family own from the trap of internet pornography. I tell them for 53 cents a day or $16 a month, you can make sure your little girls never stumble onto pornography as she uses Snapchat or does any internet searches while doing her homework. For 53 cents a day, you can make sure your son never falls into the trap of pornography or even sees it accidentally while online. I say for 53 cents a day, you can protect your wife from getting trapped in the trap of internet porn and protect your marriage. And I tell them for 53 cents a day, you can help break the cycle of internet pornography that's been holding in your life. Guys, you and your family, and most importantly, your walk with God, cannot afford for you not to use Covenant Eyes. So, head to MantorMinistries.com and hit the Covenant Eyes button in the upper right-hand corner to get one month of free service. Try it out. I know you're going to love it. You're never going to regret it. Guys, do it today. You can't afford not to have Covenant Eyes be a part of your life. Listen to the Mantor Guy podcast on the go via Apple Podcast and Google Play. Thanks. Men of God, we can't keep burning daylight. It's time to rise and shine. Mantor Ministry presents Burning Daylight, the godly man's call to rise and shine. 
This is the most important book we've released yet as we give a rallying cry to God's men to throw off all complacency and rise and shine. This book is designed to help you know what you believe, why you believe it, and how to recognize the false teaching of progressive Christianity so you don't fall into its trap. It's time we rise from our beds and shine bright to a dark world. Order your copy today at mantorministries.com slash burning daylight. No more burning daylight, men. It's time to rise and shine. Welcome back to the Mantor, Mantor Guy Podcast. Podcast. Welcome back, guys, as we continue the remainder of this message from our 2021 North Central PA Mantor. God, uh, God's way is so counterculture. Uh, so we're in a culture war, see? And as Christians, we got to live counter to the culture. And if we want to rise and shine for God, I'm being honest with you guys, really. Uh, and you know what? This isn't easy. I struggle with it. You struggle with it. We all struggle with it. But if we're going to rise and shine for the Lord, we've got to take a close look at what's acceptable in our culture and realize we probably have to go the opposite. And that's, that's, that's a challenge. And it's going to take a strong decision on your part and the help of the God to do that. If we don't, we, be, we fall into complacency. And we flow with the culture. And I can't tell you how many times people have come to me through the years. And, and, uh, and, 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 it's, and you pastors know what I'm talking about. You get it, I'm sure, too. But coming together, we have a lot of it down in Philadelphia. Pastor, we love each other. We're not married. We're living together. But God understands. One guy said, God, God understands, Pastor. He wants us to get a taste of it before, before we commit ourselves. I mean, I can't believe I hear this stuff. And so, but that's acceptable in our culture, but it's not acceptable in the kingdom of God. And, uh, and that's just one illustration, but we've got to learn to go counter culture. Let me give you one more. Another reason why Samson didn't rise and shine is because Samson ignored the word of God. I love the word of God. How many of you love the word of God? I love the Bible. Amen. Can I say something to you? I mean, with all my heart. I said this to our church one time, and, and a couple of folks just didn't quite understand it. And, uh, you know, and you may think I'm a horrible sinner when I say this, but that's all right. I'm being transparent with you. Every time I read the Bible every morning, I read the Bible, uh, I go into God's Word every day, I pray every day. I don't know how you find this. Maybe I'm a strange bird. I don't know. See, every time I read the Bible, I come away convicted. I never can read the Bible and just come away feeling good about myself. Isn't that strange? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking like some people, oh, pastor's in the sin. No, I'm not in the sin. Well, I don't think so, but unless I got something there, God knows, and I haven't seen it yet. But, uh, you know, every time I read the Word of God, it always challenges me. Every time. Even when I want to sit down and read it just devotionally. and You know, I, I don't care what passage it is. There's something that jumps off the pages that i got to change. It's a challenge to me. Now, guys, I don't look at that as a bad thing. I look at that as a good thing. Amen? Because if Samson would have dwelt more on the word of God, see, he wouldn't have got tangled up with Delilah. And maybe he would have risen and shined. And uh, Jesus said it this way in John 8, 31. Listen to what Jesus said. Sometimes we don't realize the power of his words. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples. Indeed. And then there's a period after that. Wait a minute, Jesus. <laughs> if you abide in my word, you are my disciples. Indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's the truth that makes us free. Jesus, but Jesus has said something powerful. He says, if you don't abide in my word, you're really not my disciples. Wow. That's a powerful statement to me. I mean, Jesus is cutting it. He's not playing around with us. He says, if you don't love my word, if you don't depend on my word, if you don't let my word be part of your life and change you. Now I know why I get convicted every time I read the word because it goes right back to what Jesus said. If you don't abide in my word, you're not my disciples. And you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. I can't experience freedom in Christ until I allow the truth of the word to change me. So I want to challenge you guys today. I, 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 don't, I don't always uh, believe every statistic, but there was a statistic that came out uh, some months ago, and, and maybe it was a COVID year statistic. I don't know, but um, it, was, it, it blew me away. Here it is, guys. 
And I, I, just, I just don't want to believe it's that way with you. The statistic came out that only half of men in our churches today read the Bible in a given year. I, wait a minute. But then that wasn't, a, that wasn't the one that bothered me. The one that, bothered, the one that followed it. They said only 20% of men read the Bible once a week in our churches. Now listen to me, guys. Come on. It's the truth. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you've got to be in the Word. We can't go counterculture. We can't rise and shine unless the Word is so deep in us because it's God that causes us to rise and shine. We're not something special. You can be a gifted person. Your gifts don't mean anything if they're not going to be anointed by God. Amen? At least in the, in the, in the spiritual sense. And uh, so we need to be in the Word. And it t- goes right back to the Lordship of Jesus. And, and uh, how many of you know what the Lordship of Christ means? And I'm just going to end. The, the Lordship of Christ is part. We need to get a grasp on it. We've lost in the church the ability to understand the Lordship of Christ. When you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, how many remember when you were saved? Do you remember the prayer you prayed? Well, let me tell you what the prayer was, probably. The prayer was, Lord, I want you to be my, forgive me of my sin, come into my heart, I'm a sinner, and I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Does that sound familiar? Come on, does it sound familiar? I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Talk about the power of words. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Now, we find it so easy to accept him as our Savior. The Savior part is easy. I mean, there's no effort. You go to God, take away my sins. He takes away your sins. Labels you justified, declares you righteous. There's no effort in that. But the effort, the discipleship part of our relationship with God comes in with that word Lord. See, we're not just saved. We only get, we, we not, he not only takes our sin away, but we make him the Lord of our life. It's called the Lordship of Christ. You know what the Lordship of Christ means? We can't rise and shine if we don't have a grasp on the Lordship of Christ. It means we literally gave our life over to God. It's not ours any longer. We don't make the decisions we want to make with our life. We don't go where we want to go. We don't do what we want to do. Look, God doesn't care if you go fishing or or your hobby is riding a bike. He don't care about that stuff. I'm talking about the very critical things in your life. We flow according to the Word of God. In the Lordship of Christ... God owns me. He owns my ministry. He owns my life. He owns my voice. He owns my talent. He owns my children. He owns my wife. He owns the church. The church is his. It's not mine. Everything is it. He's the Lord. I'm simply a stork. I'm only a manager. Only a manager of what God owns. Now, I don't know about you, but that changes everything. That changes everything. If we don't get that straight in our heart, we can't rise and shine. Because God's not going to bless complacency. Would you stand with me to your feet? The Lordship of Jesus Christ is so critical. We've got to get to the place where we say, God, my life is yours. But mean it. You own me, Lord. And, And you say, okay, God owns me. What's he want me to do? That's why we have the Bible. The Bible is not only God's love letter to you, but it's God's directions for you. Now, I'm not good at reading a direction books. How about you? Amen? Uh, how many of you do what I do? Come on. My wife gets on my kid. I'll go buy something. There's a dra- Oh, I can do this myself. Five hours later, I'm going back to the book. And I've already put screws in where they weren't supposed to be. And you got a mess on your hands. That happened to you? All right. Yeah. So, you know, uh, but when it comes to our spiritual life, we can't bypass the book. We got to read it. And if we're going to rise and shine, we got to read what's in this book. It's got to be a part of our life every day in prayer. That's where God can convict us. And so, Pastor, I go to church, I get convicted. No, it's not enough. Every day you need a diet of the Word of God. And let me tell you something if you get a diet of the Word of God every day, you know what you're going to do? You're going to come in church, and your pastor's going to think revival hit the church. Because if everyone's quiet, you're going to be shouting. Or you're going to be enjoying the message. You know why? Because you were into the word all week. It changes the attitude. It changes the atmosphere in your life. It causes you to rise and shine. We don't want to be like Samson. Amen. We want to do it right. Would you close your eyes? And every head bowed, every eye closed and, and for one moment. And, and uh, I just want to give an opportunity uh, for you just to get things right with God. We may have some guys in here that never gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. That's normal for, 
there, we, have, we have people that have come to church and never been saved and uh, never given their heart to Jesus Christ. Some others may be in here. You say, Pastor, I once was on fire for God, but I've become complacent. Now, if we had an altar call for complacency, I'd be the first one up there. See, we pastors, we're not preaching to you thinking we have it all together. We know the struggles. Please. We all have fallen into that trap. So we're not going to have an altar call for everyone feels like they're complacent. But if you're here and you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, and you would love to do that today, we'd love to pray with you. I wonder if you just come. Come on, walk up. Come on, stand across the front here. And, uh, and if you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ. Come on, God's a good God. Amen. And uh, you say, Pastor, I go to church. I'm saved. No, no. Going to church is what you do after you're saved. Now you understand why you're going. But church can't save you. And, uh, you know, calling yourself a Christian doesn't save you. We need a genuine conversion where we give the lordship of our life over to Jesus Christ. We understand that. Is there anyone here that needs to do that? And I realize in a setting like this, there may not be, but um, if we want to give you an opportunity. Is there anyone in here who say, Preacher, I was once on fire for God, but, but I've fallen so far back, I want to come and rededicate my life to Jesus Christ. Come on, don't be ashamed. And uh, this is, this is, you're in a safe environment today, amen? You're with a bunch of guys that know the road's not that easy. They all struggle with things. We all struggle with things. And uh, so it's a great environment, to be honest with God. Take the mask off and say, I want to rise and shine for the Lord. Come. Would you come? Come on and make things right with God. Is there anyone? God bless you, sir. Hallelujah. Who else would come? Just say, I want to get my heart right with God. I want to get back to where I was. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. God's good. God's good. Could we have someone come forward and just uh, let's pray for these? And, and uh, you know, thank you, Pastor Hammer. And uh, you, know what? Let's, let's, you know what? Let's pray a prayer for all of us to pray it today, all right? I, 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 there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with you repeating the sinner's prayer a million times in your life. Right? Nothing wrong with that. God never says you can't do it too much. Amen. And uh, I, I grew up in an early Assembly of God church. Some of you know what I'm talking about. We grew up with the idea that every morning you had to get up and give your heart to Jesus again. You may have, you may have dreamed something that was sin. And you know, you know what I'm talking about. And you had to make it right every day. And uh, well, thank God we know it's, that's not the way the case. But let's just pray a prayer out loud right now. And uh, just make a, and these that have come, pray this prayer out loud. Mean it from your heart. And uh, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we come to you. We know you are our Lord and Savior. You died on the cross for our sin. And we come to you as sinners. We asked you, Lord Jesus, to take away our sin. And become the Lord of our life. Take our lives. Lead us. Guide us. Bless us. Strengthen us. We thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Brad's going to sing. The Mantor Guy's final thought. What an inspiring challenge for God's men. I hope this message today challenged you to take the lessons and apply it to your life. I hope it helped you where you're at today so you can move forward into a deeper walk with God. But guys, we're out of time for this week. So before we go, would you remember to take a second to give us a five-star review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play? And also remember we're available on Amazon Music and Spotify. Also, don't forget, you can find all about our Mantor conferences, our dates, our locations, our speakers, everything you need to know at MantorMinistries.com. MantorMinistries.com also has information of all of our books, our resources. You can read the first chapter of almost all of our books there for free. And you can also check out our monthly newsletter there. There's so much information and resources available for you at MantorMinistries.com. I encourage you, check it out. Visit the website today. But guys, we're out of time for this week. So once again, thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next week on the Mantor Guy Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Mantor Guy Podcast. Be sure to visit MantorMinistries.com to learn more about our books, men's ministry resources, and our Mantor conferences. Hey guys, Jamie Holden here. Did you know that only 10% of churches have a healthy, thriving men's ministry? That's only one out of 10 churches. Well, my mission is to see this number become 100%. 
Join me in my work with HEUS Missions to help develop men's ministry in the local church. Become a monthly financial investor in the work God called me to do by going to mentorministries.com slash partner and clicking on the Give Online button. Together, we can see God continue to move among men. One more thing before I wrap up this week, guys. You need to head to CovetedEyes.com and sign up today to protect you and your loved ones from the many traps awaiting you on the internet. You know, I am a Covenant Eyes user. I just signed my 69-year-old father up and put Covenant Eyes on his phone and his laptop. I believe in it. It's an amazing tool. It helps you stay pure online. Guys, I encourage you to try it today. If you use the code MANTOR, you get 30 free days. That's 30 free days. What do you have to lose? So head to CovenantEyes.com. Try it today. Like I said, what do you have to lose, guys? The Mantor Guy Podcast, helping men grow in their walk with God.